So at this point, we know what the definition of a group is in abstract algebra. It's a set of elements and an operation, a binary operation, that satisfies associativity, the closure property, the identity property, and the inverses property. And that's all that a group is. It's a pretty sparse structure. And so what's surprising is that we can get so much mileage out of a structure with very few limitations. We have very little to work with when it comes to groups. Um, so, for example, we saw that just that bare set of definitions also guaranteed the uniqueness of the identity, uniqueness of inverses, the left and right cancellation property, and we also saw how to take the inverse of a product using the shoes and socks property. So we already have a lot on the table that we understand about groups. So, of course, we want to take that a step further. And we're going to do that by beginning by focusing our study on groups that only have a finite set of elements. We're going to call those finite groups. If we can get our hands around finite groups in some nice way, um, then we should have a lot to work with. But even finite groups, it turns out, have a, a wide variety of different structures that they can have. So what we want to do in this video is start to look at the definition of what is it that makes a group finite? What are some definitions that we can attach to finite groups that we might not want to attach to, to infinite groups? Um, and then begin to think about what the building blocks of groups are so that we can understand how smaller groups can live within and comprise the building blocks of larger groups. So there we'll talk about subgroups and how those work. So here are some of the goals. Now the first is that there's a big nasty question lurking in, in abstract algebra that we can already pose right now. Suppose you come up to me on the street and you give me a bag full of elements, right? You give me a finite set of n elements, and you hand it to me, and you say, make me a group. First of all, can I even do it? If you hand me a bag of 23 elements, can I make a group? Can I make an operation that turns those 23 elements into a group? Associativity, closure, identity, inverse. Um, and the second question is, if it's true that I can do that, how many different ways could I do that? Uh, what kind of choices do I have to make when I put together a group with a finite set of elements? Um, and that is a really big question. So for example, if your bag of elements that you hand me has six elements in it, A, B, C, D, E, and F, um, then my job in figuring out how to make a group out of these elements is to try and come up with a Cayley table, for example. This would be a very explicit way for how to do this. If I can fill in this Cayley table with the the products quote unquote of these six elements in a way that makes this structure satisfy the hypotheses of what a group is then i've succeeded in this task but i probably had to make some choices along the way that affect the particular answer and if you and i both did this task would we necessarily get the same group what does the same even mean in a context like this so those are the big nasty questions that we want to get to the goals for this section are as follows. First of all, for a finite group, we can define a notion of order, the order of the group. Um, and we can also define, really in any group, a notion of order that attaches to elements. So we're going to talk about two different kinds of order, and that's going to start in this video. The order of a group and the order of elements within that group. We're also going to be able to take a look at a subset of a group. So just a few of the elements within that group and ask whether that subset has enough of the group properties in its own right to form what we can call a subgroup. So this will be a smaller group within a group, if you like. The third goal is to be able to classify groups and subgroups as cyclic, or possibly not cyclic, and abelian, or possibly not abelian. So these are a couple important definitions we can attach to the whole group. We can also attach them to smaller subgroups as well. And finally, with all of that on the table, particularly when we're thinking about the notion of abelian, which is going to have to do with the commutative property. That's something that not every group has. Um, but when we start to think about the commutative property, uh, we can also try to locate some smaller places within a group in which the commutative property might hold, even if it doesn't hold on the whole group. And so there we'll be able to talk about the center of a group and the centralizer of an element within that group. So let's get started by pursuing this first goal, identifying the order of a group and talking about the order of elements within a group. So what is the order of a group? The order of a group is a very simple definition. All it is, is it's the cardinality of its set of elements. It's an answer to the question, how many elements are there in my group? For example, if we have the multiplicative group of units modulo 9, then that group consists of the 
equivalence classes mod 9 of 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, and 8. And so we would say that the order of this group is 6. Right? All we do is just count up the number of elements that are in my set. When that number is finite, as it is in this example, right, 6 is a finite number, then we will say that G is a finite group. On the other hand, if I'm looking at a different group, like maybe the group of integers under addition, the group of all integers under addition of integers, that is a group that satisfies associativity, closure, identity, inverse property, um, but it's got infinitely many elements in its set of elements. And so we would say that the order of that group is infinity, and we'll call it an infinite group. So that's one notion of order. Here's another example of a finite group, the group of symmetries of a square. We call it D4, or in some textbooks call it D8. The, the dihedral group is what D stands for. Um, so we've seen some examples of how these groups work already. Uh, and a couple weeks ago, we convinced ourselves that the elements in this group consist of these. So an identity, a rotation by 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, also a reflection, a different reflection, another reflection, and another reflection. That's what those elements end up being. And we can come up with a Cayley table if we want to. Um, I certainly spend way too much time writing out all of these elements, but it's buying me a little bit of a stall time to talk about the symmetries of a square. So first thing we notice is how many elements are there in this group? Well, all we have to do is count across. Right? The order of this group, the number of elements, is 8. And that, by the way, is the reason why some authors will call this D8 instead of D4. They'll call it the dihedral group of order 8. Uh, I prefer D4 because it reminds you of the geometry of where this came from. It's the symmetries of a regular foregon, i.e. a square. So these are the elements in my group. There's eight of them, so the order of this group is eight. But that's only one sense in which we use the word order in abstract algebra. Unfortunately, we've overloaded the word to mean two different things. So the other context in which we use the word order is not in speaking about the order of a group, but in speaking of the order of an element within that group. So the order of this group over here is eight, because there's eight elements in the group. But we can also talk about the order of an element. And the order of an element is an answer to the question, how many times do I have to multiply that element by itself? What power of that element is going to give me the identity? And it should be a little bit surprising that this always has a finite answer inside of a finite group. But that's all that it is, right? How many powers of G do I have to make before that power vanishes and just becomes the identity again? Um, and we take the smallest such number. And if no such number exists, so if, if it happens to be the case that no power of my element comes back around to the identity, then we'll say that that element has infinite order. So be very careful, especially when you're reading something silently to yourself in your mind, be very careful to distinguish between order of a group, which is how many elements are in this group, and order of an element in that group, which is what power of this element gives me back the identity. And we agree that that power has to be greater than or equal to 1, because by convention the zeroth power of any element is always equal to the identity. So let's single out an element in our uh, group of symmetries of the square. Let's say t. So I want to know what is the order of the element t. And so to answer this question, let's just start taking some powers of t. I'm going to do this with my handy dandy dihedral group um, manipulator app, just for fun, to show it off again, uh, and then we'll come back uh, and figure out what that means for our algebra. So the question is, what is the order of the element t, which is a reflection over this vertical line, is how I'll define it for this purpose. Um, what is the order of that element? So the question is, what power of t do I have to take before I get back around to the identity? And the identity transformation is the one in which our square hasn't moved at all. So the corner that I've labeled 1 matches with the corner that's labeled 1 here, 2, 3, and 4. So this is the default position of my square. So how many times do I have to apply the reflection t before I come back to this initial configuration? If I apply t once, I get a single reflection. And so now this is clearly not the identity because 1 is not lined up with 1 anymore. If I apply t a second time, well now I'm right back to where I started. So immediately we can see that t to the first power is not the identity. t to the second power is the identity. t to the third power, if I do t again, not the identity. t to the fourth power is the identity again. Not the identity in fifth power, sixth power is. Seventh is not, eighth is, and so forth. 
So that already gives me the order of this element, the order of the element t. Because the first power is t, but the second power is already the identity again. If you think about why that is, we're talking about a reflection. If I reflect something, and then I apply that same reflection again, I get exactly back to where I started. So the order of the element t in this group is the first power of it in which it becomes the identity, and that's 2. So the order of the element t in this group is 2. All right, so that's how t works. What about r? Let's bring this back in here. So for r, if I apply r once, a rotation, then I've clearly done something that's not the identity. Again, my corners don't line up with where they originally started. If I do it a second time for this square, I'm still not back to the identity. If I do it a third time, I'm still not back to the identity. It's when I do it a fourth time that now I've arrived back where I started. So for the rotation element in this dihedral group, four iterations of it, for the fourth power of it, comes back to the identity. The fifth is not, the sixth is not, the seventh is not, the eighth is, and as you might expect, so is the twelfth, so is the sixteenth, so is the twentieth power, and so on. But in the definition of order, we take the smallest natural number for which that power of our element is the identity. And so the order of this rotation in the dihedral group of the square is 4. There we go. So the first time we see the identity in the list of powers is the fourth power. And it might be a little bit less obvious, but let's do one more example here. What would the order of the element tr in this group be? Sorry, tr squared. Tr squared. What would we, how many times would we have to take a power of tr squared before we get back to the identity? So let's try that. So if I do tr squared once, t r r, this is what I get. Clearly that thing is not the identity. So the order of that element is not 1, therefore. So if I apply tr squared again, let's see what happens. T r r. And look at that. I'm back to the identity where I started. And so at this point, I don't even need to do more powers. Right? The first power of tr squared is not the identity, but the second power of tr squared already is the identity. And therefore, the order of the element tr squared is again 2. And if you do the geometry on this, you'll find that tr squared is indeed also a reflection, just like t was. It's a different reflection than t was. Like Who knows, maybe it's this one. But if you do that same reflection twice, as with any reflection, you end up back at the identity again. So that's the lowdown on the order of a group, how many elements are in the group, and the order of uh, an element within that group, which is how many powers of that element do I need to take before I end up back at the identity. So the next question is, how can we take these ideas and use them, particularly the idea of taking powers of a single element, how can we use that idea to understand how smaller groups can live within a larger group? That's the question of subgroups that we'll get to in our next video.